Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. and Thank you for joining us for the Virtual Doctors Night Out with our host, Dr. Kelly Ann, and I will turn it over to her. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Doctors Night Out. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly Ann Petrucci, and you know by now what Doctors Night Out is all about, bringing you the latest and best information from experts that I know, love, and trust. These are experts that, experts that are committed to integrity, growth, and authenticity. These are your true truth seekers. These are the doctors that I trust most. Tonight, we have an amazing panel. And I have to tell you, this is a power panel here tonight. We have Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, Dr. Amy Shaw, Dr. Stephanie Estima, and Pat Flynn, a very good friend of mine in the fasting world. And tonight, of course, the topic is fasting. We want to know, should we be fasting right now? Is it safe and is it smart to do right now? And how protective is it? Is it going to help our immune system right now? Lots of questions. And you know, I, I think this really came to mind for me because I thought, gosh, you, you have to really think about things in the right paradigm, think about things right, because right now I feel like there's so much being taken away from everyone, so much taken away, so much deprivation. Does this feed into that? Or is there a different way we should be looking at this? Should we be looking at fasting as a way of abundance rather than a way of taking things from us. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Estima. Hi, welcome to the Hi. panel. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thank you. It's an honor. Yeah, I'm so happy you're here. Dr. Estima has really impressed me for a long time. She puts out really positive uh, content and she's a real power, power, powerful woman. Dr. Stephanie Estima is a big hearted, energetic and compassionate healer dedicated to changing lives through evidence-based health strategies like chiropractic, nutrition, fitness, and mindset. She studied neuroscience and psychology and received her Bachelor of Science with honors from the University of Toronto. She went on to complete her Doctor of Chiropractic degree of the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. And I have to tell you, uh, that chiropractic school, it's probably the hardest chiropractic school out there. The people that <laughs> go to that school have to study unbelievably. So I'm so happy you're here. Welcome. And I, I'm really proud of the work that you've done and you're really putting out a lot of good stuff. So we all here know about, we know about intermittent fasting, but you talk about that, you know, women and men, they, they kind of have to approach this differently and that women aren't just little men. Explain that to us. Yeah, I, I mean, I say that in, in jest. I often say, you know, women, we're often treated like smaller versions of men with these pesky hormones that we have to deal with all the time. And this is how we've been studied in the literature. This is how it's been, um, this is how women have traditionally been treated. Now, of course, that's changing. We're starting to see more research that's done that's female centric. But in general, when we think about the protocols that are out there for fasting, most of them are male based. So you'll see a lot of online health experts and fitness gurus, and they'll say, hey, let's all just jump into a five day fast together. And when you think about a woman's you know, a woman has a very unique hormonal landscape compared to her male counterparts. So there's different metabolic hormones. We respond to them differently. Things like leptin, for example, which is a, a hormone that is involved in satiety. It makes us feel full. Uh, generally, we uh, females at any given weight, when you, when you compare females pound for pound to men, we tend to have more leptin uh, insensitivity compared to the guys. The same is true for the opposite hormone, ghrelin, which is our, I always call it like the little gremlin in your stomach, right? It's the thing that makes you feel like you're hungry. We often will reach those hunger points sooner than our male counterparts. And of course, you know, even just we, for 40 years, we have a menstrual cycle, right? So there's every single day of the month, we have a distinct hormonal landscape. And of course, from that, there's going to be times when it is a really great time to fast during your menstrual cycle. And there's times that are not as optimal or that are much more difficult because you have hormones that are promoting appetite uh, stimulation that are slowing down your bowels, you know, this kind of thing. So 
um, for women, fasting is a unique and it's much more nuanced. We are, we're just extra. We're just, we've always been extra. And I think that we need to treat fasting in the same way. So I like to think about uh, for women, there's sort of three different levers that I like to think about when we're talking about fasting for a female. So one of them is, you know, the type of fast that she's engaging in. So there's different types of fast. So it can be uh, what I call non-caloric liquid fast. So that can be water, herbal tea. We can have caloric liquid fast that you uh, have done such great work on when we talk about collagen, bone broth fasts, when we talk about, you know, putting some MCT in your or butter in your coffee, that would be a, a liquid fast that has some calories. And then there's fasting mimetics, like things like the ketogenic diet and, and, and having sort of a, a model of caloric restrictions. So that's the type of fast. We can play with the length of the fast. So how long you do it, right? It can be a couple of hours. It can be a day. It can be a couple of days. And then the frequency with which you're fasting. So that's another lever that you can pull. So are you are you fasting daily? Are you doing a longer fast once a month in concord like concordant with your menstrual cycle? Are you doing it quarterly? And then I'll have a special caveat again, like I mentioned before, for a woman who's menstruating or she still has her cycle every month. We want to be thinking about where they are in the cycle. So there's there's four main events in a woman's menstrual cycle, but it's basically divided into you're either producing an egg or you've released the egg. So you're either in the follicular stage or you're in the luteal phase. That's the, the, the official titles for those two areas in your menstrual cycle. In your follicular phase, so the first half of your cycle, so when you are on your period and leading up to when you release an egg, your body is much more, it will tolerate a fast or more aggressive fast better in your follicular phase than it will in your luteal phase. So after you've released the egg and you're sort of leading up to the, um, leading up to your, your period. Okay. So this one is for you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Amy Shaw has been on the show before and everybody loves Dr. Shaw. How are you? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Kelly. So fun. Yeah. So Dr. Shaw graduated magna cum laude from Cornell University, world renowned school of nutrition. She went on to receive her medical doctorate with distinction with training from Cornell, Harvard, and Columbia. She helps busy people transform their health using cutting edge nutritional and medical science. Her proven techniques to heal inflammation utilize the power of the microbiome to help digestion, obtain national, uh, nat natural hormone balance, and heal food sensitivities. She's a well-known expert on intermittent fasting for women. Dr. Shaw, a question. Is all this fasting safe? And particularly right now, I mean, that, that's really the question. The questions that come to mind, is it safe? Should we be doing it? And does it take too long to get the benefits from fasting? Okay, lots of great questions, Kelly. So the first question you had is, is it safe? Um, in any form of um, a diet change or a health, healthy lifestyle change, it's really the 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 poison or the tonic is in the dose and how you utilize it. So I do think that, I think we talked about it last time for, for those of people who weren't there last time, fasting is a hormetic stressor. That is how it works. It's almost like when you go out and do a high intensity workout or a weight training session and you're stressing those muscles out so that when they repair, they will grow and get stronger and more resilient for the next time you do that kind of workout. Same thing with fasting. You have to understand that you're giving your body a hormetic stressor and hormetic stressors are great. Exercise is a great hormetic stressor analogy because we are so used to doing that type of hormetic stressor. So I, I feel that you have to understand that the base, basis of this is to grow from giving your body a little bit of a hormetic stress. So if you are already stressed or if your cortisol is out of control because of other things, you're not sleeping well, you're um, completely stressed out due to this situation, um, make sure you're getting that under control first. It's like you don't wanna go and lift weights when your muscles are torn and you, don't, you cannot grow that way. And that's the same way I think about fasting during this period. Make sure that you have your sleep and your anxiety and your cortisol under control before you go ahead and do some kind of intermittent fasting. 
Yeah, I, and I absolutely agree with that. I think there's a time and a place for everyone, but right now, because of some of the research that I'm seeing, seeing come out, it seems so beneficial. And Dr. Lyon, this goes to you. I'm so happy that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, in addition to just having a baby that is so cute, congratulations. She is a functional medicine physician specializing in muscle-centric medicine. She leverages evidence-based medicine with emerging cutting-edge science to restore metabolism, balance hormones, and optimize body composition. Dr. Lyon has brought unparalleled results, unparalleled results to her patients with personalized advanced nutritional interventions, metabolic and genetic testing, and behavioral action plans that leave no stone unturned. Dr. Lyon was a national semifinalist in Fitness America, a professional fitness model, and nationally ranked figure competitor. As a nationally recognized authority, Dr. Lyon is a regular speaker, sought after expert, and educator. Dr. Lyon sees patients in New York City, a great clinic in New York City. So. Before we talk about fasting, I want to let all the listeners know that your work really focuses on optimizing skeletal muscle. Yes. And that's really important because that to me means youth, that that has so much to do with how we look and feel. So you can, can you talk to me about muscle as the organ of longevity? Yes. So this concept of muscle-centric medicine came from my training. I actually did my undergraduate at the University of Illinois in vitamin mineral metabolism, and I studied under Dr. Donald Lehman, who for all the science nerds out there know that he is the father, probably the godfather of protein metabolism. You know, and then it he went from medical school to residencies and finally ended up in a fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis in geriatrics and obesity medicine. And through this experience, I realized one thing in common, and that was that the health of their muscle tissue determined everything about the trajectory of aging. And by understanding muscle tissue as the largest, most dynamic organ in the body, you can prevent diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, because these are all diseases of metabolic abnormalities. And by really understanding the tissue as an endocrine organ, it, is, it does secrete myokines. It secretes anti-inflammatory properties. What it are is, myokines? Are myokines anti-inflammatory? Yes, so they are a group of proteins and they can, you know, the most common famous one or infamous one is probably BDNF for the brain. It actually is very interesting. It secretes something called interleukin-6 and other what we would consider cytokines. But when they are secreted by the muscle, it actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. Mm. It is incredibly fascinating. A couple other things that are so relevant to muscle as it relates to now. Muscle is your metabolic currency. It is responsible for your resting metabolic rate. So as we are at home, we're sitting around, it is responsible for the calories that we burn at rest. Mm. I mean, so, so, not. so since protein is so important, are there different kind of proteins that fuel you better than others? Of course. So this is very hot right now, or I would say it was very hot before Corona hit. It was this variability between animal-based proteins and plant-based proteins. And really it's based on the amino acid profile. Yeah. We know that as we age, or if you have midlife obesity or low level of chronic inflammation, your tissue becomes anabolically resistant. And this is a fancy word for the stimulus requires more, meaning you require more high quality protein to stimulate muscle tissue turnover. And that would be high quality animal-based proteins or proteins like whey protein that has a high amount of leucine, one of the essential amino acids that you have to get from your diet. Okay, so you are, you're a big fan of animal protein for fueling the body properly. I am, and you know, where this really was born was, you know, at my doing my fellowship at Wash U is, you know, half the time I spent in the nursing home half the time I spent in geriatric inpatient units. And these are the sickest group of patients. This is the end of life. There's a lot of discussion about what happens in your 30s and 40s.
But as we age, the discussion about maintaining muscle tissue really isn't, uh, ar there's no argument. We know that you have to maintain this tissue for anyone for immunity. So if you get sick, the thing that saves you is your ability to recruit energy. And you, and you directly need those amino acids. And the amino acid reservoir in the body is muscle. So can you get that amino acid profile anywhere else but through meat? Through, through No, of course. Of course you can. What a great question. And this is particularly relevant now as we move into fasting, and especially the model of calorie restriction is really having that high-quality protein. So meat and animal-based products are one you know, kind of one bucket of proteins, but you have, um, you know, fish works, eggs work, whey protein works, and then you have plant-based proteins, which require anywhere between 25 and 40% more. So uh, to kind of think of that in the big picture is you would need about six cups of quinoa to equal one chicken breast, one small chicken breast. Mm -hmm. The way to circumvent that would be to add in branch chain amino acids to your lower quality plant-based proteins. So collagen is something I love actually. Yeah, yeah. Collagen, when you add in branch chain amino acids to collagen, you now generate a complete protein. Mm. Did everyone hear that? Because I'm a big believer in collagen, as you know. I yes. know. Yes, and, and for that reason. You know, and, and it's really interesting as we get into the discussion of fasting, when I think about fasting, I think about it in two ways, really in two groups. I think about the young and metabolically healthy. That's one group. And then I think about the aging population. The aging population who already has a propensity towards anabolic resistance, fasting can be detrimental. You have to be very careful with an aging population to recommend them fasting because the way to protect that tissue is to provide a flux of amino acids. You know, and that argument is, well, can a ketogenic diet protect tissue? Well, it can, but you have to think what is optimal and what are the other benefits to the aging population or to someone who is immunocompromised. Branch chain amino acids directly feed the cells of the immune system. They are one of the, the biggest, potent, most energy dense source for the immune health, for immune health. So actually, I'm going to interject here, if you don't mind, um, Killian, in regards to, there's a question that came in in regards to when you have um, an issue like Lyme's disease or autoimmune um, issues, should you be fasting or should they stay away from that? Okay, let's, let's uh, field that one to Dr. Shaw. Yes, let me put, hey, okay, you can hear me. So absolutely, you can, um, there's lots of autoimmune disease uh, prevalence in um, uh, in the world right now, and we have seen lots of people getting great results. I think that you're right that you should definitely start low and slow. I recommend that people um, start as little as 12 hours um, of fasting, which is still a big change from the 15 hours of eating and all, like that uh, that normal um, individuals in America do. So you you're still getting some benefit with 12 hours and see how your hormones um, and your autoimmunity respond to that. As long as your hunger and cravings, as long as your sleep, as long as your mood, and if you're having periods, your hormonal cycle um, is all in check, that's a sign that you can move forward and that this is working for you. Mm. Wonderful. And I'm going to go to Pat because I, I know Pat and Pat is percolating here because there's so many of the topics that we've discussed that I know you're passionate about. Pat Flynn is the best-selling award-winning writer and author of four soon-to-be-five books, trainer of the special forces and professional athletes and just about everyone around. He's consulted many of the largest brands in the fitness industry today and continues to do so in other fields. Further, Pat is a philosopher with a high interest in human happiness, and in particular, what he, what he calls uh, music that he finds rewarding that he records on the weekends. He's a multi-talented guy. Like I said, I, I don't know if a lot of the viewers have know this, but we actually wrote a book together several years ago. That's and right. His, uh, yeah, and his brilliance was very striking to me. He has brilliance around many, many areas. Uh, so, so happy to have you on the show, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here, Kelly, and thank you.
Yeah, so I know there's a lot of topics that you are just percolating and based on what we said, as I said earlier, but you've also changed since I've met you in that when I met you, you had just met your wife. Now you have how many kids? We're up to four. Four. I mean, how did that happen? You, this, this must be. Well, I, how, many, how many details do you want? <laughs> <laughs> this has to be one a year. My gosh. Mm -hmm. So how has, let me ask you this, since you were all in quarantine right now, how mm -hmm. has it affected you and your family, you know, trying to juggle all of these different things? And you'd be the perfect person to ask this question. Is it realistic, considering what so many of us are going through right now, to even implement something like, you know, I, I know that for my immune system, there's things that are coming out that are showing me that fasting may be helpful. Is it even right. sane of us to think that we can do that and start that at this time? Right. Yeah, really, really good question. And I just want to say how much I appreciate all the important distinctions that are being made by uh, this wonderful panel of, of experts. And I, I'm not a doctor. My background's actually a little eclectic. It's in economics and philosophy and I have a long history in, in, in fitness. But fasting has always been a research interest of mine. And it's something that I've been using for years with my clients. And everything that has been said so far is, is so true, especially what Dr. Estima said about working with women. You just need a, a wider toolkit when you're working with women when it comes to fasting than you do with men. And these distinctions can make all the difference. And how you, and to your question, Kelly, and how you introduced somebody to fasting can be really important, like how you introduce somebody to exercise. If you take somebody who's never exercised before and you just throw them into the pit, at some really high intensity type of, of workout, um, not only might they get injured, but they might be really frustrated and discouraged from ever going to the gym again or exercising. So introductions are really important. And another thing that was pointed out is dosing matters. So I really like to draw the analogies to, um, to exercise with fasting because different amounts of exercise and different forms of exercise are appropriate for different populations and different people at different times. And the same thing is true of fasting. So you don't just consider the person, but you consider the environment. And obviously we are in something of a strange situation right now that might be compounding stress. It might, it, there's factors at play that should cause us to consider ways that we might modify uh, things that we introduce to people's lives that, that in some way may add a layer of stress. Now, another important distinction here is that stress can either be a use stress, it can be ultimately positive, or it can be a distress, it can be ultimately negative. And what we want is for any stress we introduce to be a use stress. So what, is, what does that look like in a time like this? Can it be done? Yeah, I think absolutely it can be done, but I think this is where we start to get into, into a more of a practical question of how can it be done? What are some ways to introduce people to intermittent fasting? And a few things have already been suggested that I'll echo, you know, a fast doesn't have to be enormous to be effective, you know, starting with a simple 12 to 15 hour fast, maybe just a few days a week could be a perfect introduction pre for people to begin to reap the benefits of fasting and also get used, you know, get used to being a little bit hungry. That's something that you have to just the same thing with exercise where you need to get used to being a little bit sore, a little bit tired, and you have to build some sort of emotional calluses to that. The same thing is true with fasting. You're entering, you're, you're trying something new and it's going to take a little bit of experience to just get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, so that's what I would say, Kellyanne, is, is for most people, most of the time, barring certain, you know, medical situations that would require, you know, um, consulting a doctor, for example, there's probably some way that we can incorporate fasting into their lives, even uh, during this, this uh, pandemic that will be very beneficial to them. So I would, I would like to encourage that and we can explore some of these specific, specific methods as we uh, go forward here. Okay, Dr. Estima, you talk about easing into fasting. So since we're trying to talk about how do we implement this, let's, let's break this down. If somebody is new to this and listening and saying, okay, and by the way, we can discuss this, but there are studies that are showing us that fasting really does help with our immune system. So if we want to start this or we want to advocate that people start this, what is the best way? Because you talk about easing into it. You talk about a couple of hours before you go to bed, you, you don't eat and explain to us why that would be helpful. Sure. Yeah. And I, if I can just add a few comments about the, there was a question around autoimmunity. There's been actually quite a bit of studying with fasting and multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition where we, your body will turn on your nervous system. And there's been a lot of 
really promising research around once those autoimmunes, if you, if the, you know, they have had studies where they've randomized patients and there's been patients who have fasted for long periods of time and those autoimmune cells have been destroyed through a process called autophagy, which we'll get into. Um, but when the new native cells of the immune system and the new native cells are being born, they're no longer autoimmune. So there's actually quite a bit of robust evidence supporting fasting for autoimmune conditions. And when we circle that back to females, of course, we know that females are, we get the short end of the stick with many things and autoimmunity is one of them. We tend to, the diagnosis, um, the spread is much higher for females than it is for men. So I just wanted to mention that as well and just piggyback on what Dr. Shaw had said. And I agree with, and Dr. Shah had mentioned this before, and I'll just kind of pick this up again. Most North Americans are eating from the moment that they wake up to the moment that they go to sleep. So they are eating for 16 hours a day. And when we want to, and for someone who has never fasted before, psychologically, what I find is that people are scared of it. It's like, oh my God, what does that mean? Am I going to go into starvation mode? Am I going to start using all my muscle and doctor, I'm going to have to go see Dr. Gabrielle, you know, so what I like to tell people is to just dip your toes in the pool, see that the water's warm, and then we can start to expand from there. So I love to introduce a 12 hour fast for most people. And I think that's already been mentioned. Uh, a 12 hour fast is basically just, if you assume that you're going to sleep for about eight hours, all we're talking about is adding four hours of your day where you're not eating. So, and you can even, you can even cleave that. So you can have two hours in the morning where you're not eating and then uh, so say, uh, stopping your meals two to three hours before you go to sleep. So that's the way that I like to start. It, it's, you will get used to that easy peasy lemon squeezy. Like you get, you, you can habituate to that in a, in a week or two. And then to your point around stopping eating earlier in the evening, this is a, I call this a night limiter. And the reason for that is it is honoring and optimizing for your circadian biology. So when we talk about, you know, it's a fancy word for sleep and wake cycles, right? So your body will take in cues from your environment uh, one is light. So this is why we talk about blue light in the evening. It's not really great because your, your brain is taking in light signals saying, oh, it's, there's so much blue light. It must be midday. I don't have to start secreting melatonin to go to sleep. Um, the same is true for food. So we have a master clock in the body. It's called uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, if you want to say that five times fast, it's party tricks, nice, nice long word, but the, uh, the SCN for short, this is your master clock. This is this, this is the, you know, the, the, um, the head foreman or head forewoman who sort of says it's light, it's time to wake up or it's night, it's time to go to sleep. But when you eat, and if we think about a typical North American family, they're going to have the bolus, of, like the largest bolus of energy is typically in the evening. So they might have a big dinner with their family, then they might sit on the couch and maybe watch Netflix, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven episodes of Netflix. And they're having, you know, a glass of wine, they're maybe having some snacks in the evening. So your, your liver is going to say, which is also another clock in the body that takes cues in from your environment, is going to say, hey, wait a minute, we're getting all of our energy. It's time to ramp up and rev up the system and use this energy for hunting, for survival, for whatever. So there's this dissonance. There's a, there's a difference if you were eating late at night your brain wants you to start winding down, but your liver is like, hey, we got all this food. So one of the strategies that I like to implement once somebody has mastered that 12-12, so 12 hours of fasting, 12 hours of, of uh, a feeding window, yeah. is to now do that night limiter. So it is three, two to three hours before you go to sleep. And all that is allowing for is that you're, it'll allow for digestion to happen, happen and to start moving you towards that post-absorptive state. So your stomach is allowed to empty and you're able to go to sleep on an empty stomach. And I don't, I don't know about uh, you uh, guys, but when I, have when I have eaten too late, I have the worst dreams. I have the craziest dreams when my stomach is full and I can't maintain sleep. I often wake up often uh, overnight as well and the quality of my sleep is impacted. So allowing your stomach to fully empty is just a wonderful way for you to enhance the quality of your sleep, which of course, I mean, that's another, that's another discussion entirely around immune function and, and sleep and what happens there, but facilitating the best sleep that you can is why I like to 
pull back the eating window to, you know, so if you go to sleep at 10 o'clock, you know, your last meal is at seven, you go to sleep at 11, you know, you, you, you finish eating at around eight. There's a lot of people out there that are really struggling with sleep and they need any tricks that they, they can pull out of their sleeve. Fasting, breaking down muscle. This is what we hear all the time, Dr. Lyon. If I, if I fast, my muscles are going to break down. I'm going to, I'm going to have that string bean look. I can't do it. True or not? No, it's not actually entirely true. Again, it goes by where are you in life? When you're young, if you, there's really two ways to stimulate muscle tissue. Number one, and by the way, Pat, thank you for all the work with, I don't know if you said special forces or special operations, but if you said special operations, we are in that crew, by the way. Groovy. Yeah. Back there. There you go. Oh, um, cool. Anyway, so will you lose muscle if you fast? If you are young and you are active, you definitely maintain your tissue. If you are older and you are less active and you're fasting, the likelihood of you losing tissue, that risk benefit, or as they say, is the juice worth the squeeze, becomes a little questionable. Um, and I have seen that over and over in clinic, in geriatric clinic, in the inpatient unit is, those that then restrict their food and in particular their protein, that becomes an issue. But if you are young and healthy and even midlife and healthy and you are training and moving and offsetting that caloric restriction, you can definitely maintain your time. Dr. Gabrielle, here's a, here's a question. How much does resistance training affect that, especially later in life? What a great, I mean, that is, is probably one of the most important things. And even midlife, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. when you're younger, say up to 20, you're really driven by hormones. And then as that hormonal milieu changes, resistance training, I would say is 50-50. And then mm -hmm. as you age even more advanced, I think, you know, listen, and I don't have data to support this, but I think that actually it almost swings a little more that you require protein, which, I mean, that's a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. But resistance training is, as you age, is, that's one of the most important things that you can well, do. And it's funny that you asked that because she stole your question. That was going to be your question, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, so this whole thing about fasting and working out, and thanks for that, Dr. Lyon. How should we fast and, and work out fasted, or should we make sure that we have protein before we work out? What is the best option for us? If someone says, I'm on a great workout schedule now, I don't want fasting to screw it up. Right. Yeah. I think there's a couple of ways we can approach this. And um, when it comes to holding on to muscle, retaining muscle, and especially building muscle, you know, resistance training is incredibly important uh, at, at all stages of life, I would argue. And it does seem to have a, a, an effect, uh, a muscle sparing effect as well. So it's definitely something that you want to consider if you're going to be engaged, well, I think you should consider it no matter what, fasting or otherwise. Then how to combine it with fasting, I think is going to be entirely case dependent. It's gonna come back to stress again. I've had um, many clients that really enjoy working out in a fasted state, they do well at that. We make sure that they do get adequate protein. Uh, I'm fully on board with protein being a non-negotiable. It's also one of those hinge factors in diets. We know if we just push protein up, all types of good things start to happen. So where, however you approach diet, <laughs> dietary protocols, protein is just one of those critical things you have to focus on. And then where you time that, you know, there's different, different arguments and ways you can approach it. I'm not the same with every client, but it's, it's, it's a focus of every client. So for some clients, yeah, they, they train in a fasted state. I very much agree with Dr. Estima. I think one of the best ways to start is to kind of pad your sleep with fasting pillows, if that makes sense. So you kind of fast a little bit longer out of sleep, you fast going into sleep, uh, funny that uh, you mentioned that, Dr. Estima. I have the wackiest dreams when I eat before bed. They're just absolutely bizarre. Um, so you're not alone there, and I sleep very poorly. And I think it is important to remember that that we have to think of the integrated whole. And if we're not, if we're getting too stressed from 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 other areas of our of our life, including fasting and exercise, that we're then sleeping poorly. Well, we know that's going to have a cascade effect as well then our poor sleep is going to diminish our willpower. We're going to have more cravings, less energy to work out. So we really have to make sure that we're kind of balancing the entire picture and seeing how everything fits. Um, so yeah, if you're feeling good, you're feeling that the stress is, is manageable. I, I know a lot of people like to just get that workout in first thing in the morning while they're still fasted. Again, intensity levels depending. And then they, they make sure that you have some, some protein after that. Other clients prefer to you know, work out later. 
when uh, maybe after they've already eaten. Um, so I think it's so case dependent, but generally I would say, yes, absolutely. To me, this is not an either or, it's, it's a both and. Dr. Shaw, what do you see in clinic? Do you put patients on fasts in clinic and do they have a hard time, easy time? And what is the best way to break a fast? Is it different depending on what type of fast? Yes, so there's a few different things um, that we were that you were asking here, and there's definitely different types of fasts for different people. I'm in the camp um, for women, especially to, as we talked about, all of us kind of um, outline to go slow. I love the concept of fasting pillows because that's exactly how I think um, I would tell people to say, let's do a circadian fast, which kind of um, brings in the benefits of circadian rhythm syncing and also intermittent fasting. And okay, hold on one go, second. What, what do you mean? What do you mean, Dr. Shaw, by circadian rhythm syncing? Can you explain that? Yes. So we have a clock in every single one of our cells, not just in our brain and the suprachiasmatic nucleus. As um, uh, Dr. Schema said, it's all over our whole body, every cell including the liver cell, including um, the brain. And everybody needs time to repair and renew. And for all of us, it, for thousands of years, that time has been sleep and nighttime. So if you can imagine, if you are getting guests to your door all day long and all night long, you can never go deep clean and organize your house. Your kitchen is gonna be a mess you're going to never be able to repair and renew. And that's what happens to most Western people. We are, uh, we're asking our body to be working on metabolism all the time and never giving it adequate rest. And so what I mean by you know, circadian syncing is know this uh, hardwired biology in our cells and put it to use. So we know that even skin, okay, we're saying forget the, uh, forget fitness, forget, you know, um, disease. We're just, you want to look younger, right? You want less um, uh, UV damage to your skin, less wrinkles. Your skin has a circadian clock. And if you expose your skin to bright blue light in the nighttime hours, you age faster, you get more wrinkles, you get more cancers. I mean, this is like a no brainer, right? Like, at night, turn off your blue light 90 minutes before bed because when you have one exposure to blue light, your melatonin gets delayed by 90 minutes on average. What, what, what so, kind of things emit blue light? Um, cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, you can put a like a blue light blocker on your cell phone, you, TVs, um, white, basically white light. So what we have done in our home that everybody could easily do is turn up all the blue light sources, the TVs, the phones, and computers, and then um, kind of put in these yellow uh, bulbs that are not like uh, a white light, blue light, that you can get those um, very easily. And just kind of like the old school uh, bulbs that you can keep on low or dim. Um, you can have a nighttime routine, you can read or whatever. So circadian syncing just means that tweaking your daily lifestyle to improve your health, um, and that includes circadian fasting, is um, as we have already covered a little bit, that having a few hours, two to three hours before bed, and having that time for your body to start saying, oh wait, nobody's coming through that door. Let's start now repairing and renewing. And um, that's why your sleep is better. That's why your skin is better. That's why you can put off disease in the long run. Uh, Pat, you talk a lot about working out in the morning. Is it better for growth hormone and testosterone to work in the morning? Does it kick that in a little fiercer? The one thing that I would say about workout timing, and of course, taking into practical considerations people's lives, you know, it's, it's better to, to have some exercise rather than none. So I wouldn't get too obsessed about timing, is to just echo the points that were already said about, about circadian rhythm syncing and timing, that if we're training or stressing ourselves out too, too late in the day, this could, that, that would be my primary concern, that we might be messing with our, our sleep cycle there. Um, we know that, that exercise, especially resistance training in general, has a very positive hormonal effect when done well. I think um, when it comes to trying to optimize the timing, again, for most people, most of the time, I'm just concerned with them getting some of it done and not having it negatively affect their sleep. 
if possible. So that's that would be my primary Dr. way. Dr. Lyon, do you feel the same? I totally agree with Pat. And one of the other things what he's alluding to is that training low concept, training that low glycogen, which is the storage form of carbohydrates, training in a low glycogen state is can have some beneficial effects. So I totally agree with what Pat's saying. So I want to narrow in this question because I want to make sure that a lot of people out there are really worried about the state of affairs and they're worried about their own health and, and all of that. So I just want to ask the panel, what would you say the best kind of fast to do now? And do you feel that fasting is something that everyone that everyone should really start thinking about for their immune system now? And is there any supplements that you would recommend that they take during fasting or is that completely counterproductive? Let's start with you, Dr. Estima. Uh, this is a really good question. And I think that the answer that I am giving to people that I'm working with right now, now typically I will look at someone's hormonal composition look at their lifestyle, like Pat was saying, when can they get the exercise in and all, and all of those different, uh, different parameters. For right now, I think people are generally more stressed than they ever have been. I don't know about you guys. I mean, I know that I, I'm talking about my dreams a lot, but I've been having the craziest dreams since this whole Corona thing has been happening. So I have bad dreams when I eat late at night. And I also have been having the, just the, I go on these mat, like these crazy cosmic journeys during my dreams. But um, so for right now, when people are more stressed, so we have this HPA axis activation, which is the hypothalamic pituitary axis. This is when your brain detects a physical, a, chemi a chemical, and uh, an emotional stress. And there is a cascade of events that happens. There's a connection to your adrenal glands. Cortisol is released as a, as a, as a counter regulatory hormone. What I'm recommending for people is to not be engaging in longer fasts right now. So for me, when I say a longer fast, what that means is longer than 24 hours. And there's no study, there's no, it's just an arbitrary line in the sand that I've drawn. I think that everybody can continue to practice time-restricted feeding, uh, what is commonly referred to as intermittent fasting, where you are still eating every single day and you're just restricting the time window. Like we've been talking about the 12 hour time restrictor, 16, hour, or 16, eight is another uh, common combination where you have an eight hour eating window and then you have a complimentary 16 hour fast. So I typically will for just right now, because I, because we were talking about this being a use stress, fasting is a tool in the tool belt. It is a hormetic stress at the end of the day, it's a stress. So sometimes we don't want to, we don't want to overload the, we don't want to over, we don't want to, um, overload the, the system. So for, for me right now, my recommendation is gentler fast. So the, the TRE of, of 1212 or 16, eight is what, is what, or at a maximum of 24 hour, which is, you know, dinner to dinner. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lyon, how do you feel? What would you tell everyone right now? Just kind of be in the moment where this is like more of a COVID question, being in the moment of COVID, what we're experiencing, what would you have your patients do? Whatever they can do to calorie control. That is so essential right now when people are moving less, that there is a propensity to gain weight. For my patients, I have an active clinic here in New York City. And what we are doing as a collective is calorie control, optimizing protein intake, utilizing typically, depending on the individual in a eight, really they're feeding in about an eight hour window. And each meal has a, a minimum of 30 to 50 grams per meal of protein. And this is how, and it's kind of like those old school protein modified fasts, uh, which is really interesting. They use it in Cleveland Clinic a lot. And that's what we're doing. And in terms of supplementation, as it relates to now, uh, and specifically as it relates to COVID, COVID is new and nobody knows. You know, I have, you know, patients that are, that actively have it, patients that have been in recovery. And one of the core values that we talk about is really maintaining micronutrient health, getting enough sleep. And when I say micronutrient health, you know, it's, an easy way to think about that is just eating whole healthy foods, getting enough sleep, making sure you're getting vitamin D and exercising. So as it relates to the current situation right now, those would be my recommendations. 
And Dr. Shaw, I know we covered that with you, but another question that I want to kind of tag onto that, autophagy. Can you explain what autophagy is and how important is that to a fast? And does it just, again, just take too long to get the benefits? Can you address all of those, please? That's gr great question. I think the million dollar question is, is when does autophagy actually happen? So what autophagy is, is a lot of people became interested in um, autophagy because it's a, it's a, something that's happening in your cells all the time. This is the same analogy that I was giving um, about the people coming to your door. So what autophagy is, you have decided that there's no one coming to your door anymore and you're gonna do the deep cleaning, you're gonna take out all the garbage. It's literally self-cleaning of the cell. And what's amazing, Kellyanne, is that you can take a cell that has undergone autophagy, look at it under the microscope and it will look younger, it will look you basically, it's a fountain of youth for the cell. So who doesn't want that, right? We know that autophagy can be ramped up through certain um, uh, practices and um, can turn off uh, with certain practices like um, poor health practices. So autophagy is really the fountain of youth that everybody wants. And that's why fasting has, I think, um, really taken off in the last few years because people have noticed that, hey, this is a cheap um, way to ramp up our self-cleaning of our cells so that our cells get younger and that way we can live longer. Um, and exercise is another one, sauna is another one. So these are all really great ways. We're always kind of doing this at a low level, but we're trying to ramp that up. And it does seem that that only happens at a later stage, meaning like doesn't happen right when you start fasting. It is always happening at low levels, but it really starts to ramp up um, at the 16 hour mark and maybe um, even more so at the 24 hour mark. Um, again, it depends on the person, depends on their baseline diet, it depends on their sugar intake, it depends on their genetics. So autophagy can mean something very different to me than, um, uh, than Pat, say, uh, uh, with a different gender, age, uh, predispositions, all of that sort of diet. Um, so that's the cool and the nuanced um, answer about, you know, how long does it take and what it is. So Pat, you have a lot of people that come to you for training, training advice and all that. What are you telling people? I'm sure that people are writing into you with their unusual circumstances and their fears and so forth. Where does fasting, just give, I want everyone to have a real practical sound. Right. Right yeah, I'll add a few additional strategies here and just um, highlight some of the things that were already said. Um, one thing that I, it was popular a few years ago and it's kind of fallen away, which I think is a shame because I thought it was always a really good approach was the five, two fast. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is you don't have to fast every single day. Maybe you could start by just taking two days per week to introduce that 12 to 15 hour fast. And I wholeheartedly agree that, yeah, a tw a, more than a 24 hour fast, even, even pandemics aside is usually a lot for people, especially to start with. It's just a lot. Uh, plus, the research is pretty good. It, we reap a lot of the benefits of fasting well before then anyways. So the marginal utility to be gained versus the amount of stress and the hardship is, I actually very infrequently recommend longer fasts regardless. Um, so the 5-2 fast is a nice strategy. You know, maybe it's just Wednesday and, and Friday. I recommend non-consecutive days. Those are the days where, okay, you're going to push the intensity a little bit and you're going to try and practice some form of fasting. I find that's a very practical introduction for people. The other thing that I'll recommend that, uh, that's already been hinted at um, are, are the incorporation of protein shakes or strategic meal replacements or partial meal replacement therapy as it's sometimes called. This can be a really wonderful tool to aid in fasting. And it's all oh, that's just kind of fancy language for, for just adding protein shakes. Now, why, why does this help? Well, we've already talked about why protein is a hinge factor. So it's a good way just to push the protein numbers up in your diet. You can add fiber to it. Uh, you can make these things very nutrient dense, but calorically controlled. So they're going to, they're going to be very satiating. They're also going to make sure that, that we're not consuming too much. Um, so just to echo what Dr. Gabrielle said. So you could use these as fast breakers. You could just swap out various meals here and there 
with just a high quality protein shake throughout the week. And this will do a lot uh, again to just to hit all those things that we want to focus on more protein, more fiber, more micronutrients. And it's also really practical and convenient when I'm working with clients. It's all about lowering barriers to success, not making things more practical, more inconvenient or expensive than they need be. So that's, yeah. the, that's the thing I would, I would focus on, you know, think about throwing some protein shakes in there. I love that suggestion. I, I have to tell you when you're actually seeing patients or when you're seeing people like you do in the gym, you, you have a different perspective because you see different things, you hear different things. And I have to tell you, it is when someone has to white knuckle a lot, you have to figure out ways. This is what I say. You have to figure out ways for them to get the benefits of fasting without a full fledged fast. That's just practical, right? So maybe not go into autophagy, maybe not get every bit of the benefit but still get some. So Dr. Lyon, let me ask you this. Do you think that someone has to do more full fledged, like no eating to get benefits of fasting or like Pat, do you think that you can implement? So not at all. I don't think that you have to go through periods of a full fledged fast. You know, part of what I did in fellowship is I ran a weight management clinic and it was all about body composition and really understanding if you're talking about weight loss, it's about the quality of the weight loss. It's really about maintaining muscle tissue and losing body fat. And really the way to do that is you can, again, calorie restrict, but by keeping your protein high, you have a number of metabolic effects that happen. Number one, you increase the thermo effect of feeding. So while calorie per calorie, carbohydrates have four calories per gram and protein has four calories per gram, the amount of energy it takes may take, you know, it may take 15% more energy to utilize the protein. So again, you don't have to go through periods of long fasting to have improvement in body composition at all. Mm. And so Dr. Estima, how about water fast? Are they crazy? Uh, the short answer is it depends. Um, there's, we were talking a little bit about this at the top of the hour. There's different types of fasts that you can implement. So a water fast is something that I categorize as a non-caloric liquid fast. So a herbal tea might fall under that category as well. Um, I tend to, uh, I mean, it, it really does depend, but as a general rule, uh, women, the, the women that I work with who have androgen issues. So the PCOS is really the a very common one. So polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, they tend to respond better to non-caloric liquid fast in my clinical experience than, um, uh, than other women. And that's partially because their bodies are, are acting more male, right? So they have more testosterone. It's not being aromatized into, it's not being switched into um, testosterone, uh, estrogen, pardon me. So it's not clearing. And then they have all these, uh, the, all these metabolic changes. Um, so they are acting more male. So I find that an that is a more aggressive type of fast. So a water fast, um, uh, herbal tea fast, those are more aggressive, but in, in cases of obesity, so uh, Dr. Gabrielle Leon was saying, like her expertise is she was, she was seeing, you know, people in uh, that were, uh, that were obese. This is a really good tool for w uh, women or men who have a BMI that's over 25. Um, a water fast is a great way to lose that excess adipose tissue and to help you maintain uh, that weight over time. Uh, and same, like I was saying, there's a bit a special punch out for my PCOS women because they respond really well to that. Now, is that good for somebody who has a, a BMI that's, you know, over 18 and a half and under 25? It depends. And usually I really like to have uh, a caloric liquid fast. So the collagen uh, or having bone broth through the day. I've been keeping my mouth shut. Are you all proud of me? I've not said bone broth one time. <laughs> no, I'll, say it for you. I'll say it for you. <laughs> yeah. Caloric liquid fasts are a wonderful way to, you're still, you're still getting, you're still getting some calories in, um, but you are, um, it's not as aggressive as a water fast might be. Now there are some people and I've had people say to me, well, would you do a, just a pure fast, like no water? That is crazy. That is crazy. So not engaging in a fast where you are not drinking any liquids and any foods like that is you are asking for trouble, but water, it's okay in certain, in, it's okay in certain scenarios. Okay. So we are running out of time. It's, it, the time went by so quickly and we have quite a few questions that are coming in. 
let, let's, let's end by this. Uh, why doesn't everyone just tell me what a best practice that you'd like to leave? And the one question that I don't feel that we clearly answered, uh, let me ask this first, supplements and fasting. Should you be taking supplements while you fast, Dr. Shaw? Um, the actual answer is we don't know, meaning that people ask me all the time, will this break a fast? Will that break a fast? And um, yes. I would say if you, you know, if you're uh, prescribed a medication by your physician that needs to be taken in the morning and you are fasted, um, you just take the risk because we don't really know uh, the answer to that question. Do supplements um, break the fast? Should you? I personally wait till I break my fast to have my supplements because I don't need to take um, any particular supplement in the morning. So I would say best practices for someone who's not taking prescription medication is to wait with your first meal. You'll have um, all of your supplements um, that you're used to taking. That way you're not inadvertently, um, you know, blocking some of the benefits of your fast. Wonderful. So let's just go around. And I just want to say this has been an amazing global conversation. I really appreciate it. And I want people to really learn from this because there's strategies, tactics, techniques here that will make a really big difference. Um, we're having more questions about water fast and we will be answering these questions. Uh, so uh, Dr. Steema, if you could just give uh, some best practices as a, as a kind of a farewell to everyone on this program, what are your best practices? Uh, I can tell you what I personally do, and I can just say some general uh, best practices for everyone. So I think that everybody, irrespective of gender, irrespective of age, uh, I think that a time-restricted eating is, I think we can paint broader brushstrokes, uh, brushstrokes with, you know, you're still eating every day, you're just not eating from the time you wake up to the time that you go to sleep. So whether that's a 12-hour uh, a 16 hour. I think that that's um, great. I also echo both Pat and uh, Dr. Gabby, Gabrielle's uh, views on resistance training. So when I am fasting, I'm not sending the chemical stimulus with my diet. Like I'm not having the protein to drive the muscle protein synthesis and the MPS there, but I will give myself a mechanical stimulus. So I will always make sure that when I'm fasting, I am always doing some sort of, I work out every single day. Um, what other, what other juicy bits can I give you? Um, I always, uh, for myself personally, uh, I practice, I, I typically eat in a four to six hour window. And then I try to at least once a quarter do a 72 hour fast to engage. I'm a, you know, I'm a longevity geek. I want to know, you know, I want to try all the things that I can to live until I'm 126. That's the number I want to live until. So I want, so it's going to be a three day fast for me. Uh, I know my hormonal status. I know my physical limits. So I can, I can typically push with a, with a herbal fat, uh, herbal tea fast or a water fast for 72 hours, once, once a quarter. Dr. Lyon, thank you for that. Dr. Lyon? Yes, ma'am. All right. Best practices. First and foremost, determine your protein need for the day. And typically, for me, I recommend one gram per pound body weight, which is definitely on the higher end. I definitely believe eating in a time-restricted window is very helpful in terms of controlling satiation and all the other metabolic processes. The thing that I will add is your carbohydrate tolerance for weight management. I definitely recommend keeping it between 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrates per meal. Fasting is fantastic for calorie restriction. Macronutrient variability within each meal is essential for optimizing metabolism, for optimizing body composition. So just to reiterate, understanding your protein need, determine how much you need throughout the day, breaking it up in a macronutrient appropriate plate, anchored in protein, carbohydrate aware, and put it within those windows. Wonderful. Pat. There we go. Um, yeah, so tough to follow such good acts. I just, I'll summarize the, the main points, um, and I've learned a lot here myself. So uh, time-restricted feeding would be a great way to introduce fasting. Those Think either those fasting pillows or 5-2. Uh, re realize that you don't have to go the whole hog. You don't have to do extended fast to reap the benefits. Get the protein up, just like Dr. Gab Gabrielle said. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know, somewhere around like, you know, a gram per pound of body weight or at least lean body weight per day, I think is a, is a decent metric. 
Um, and then think about the whole, right? So get at least eight hours of sleep, uh, get the blue light out, have some type of sleep ritual, have some way of winding down, have other ways to alleviate stress, engage in regular resistance training. I'm going to leave that completely general, but just have some type of regular resistance training in your, in your weekly schedule. Uh, walk. I'm a huge fan of, of walking, especially in, like if you have nothing else to do when you fast, go for a walk, you know, get outside, brisk walk, I think in most states, people can still do that. Just you know, keep six, you know, keep the social distancing in play. Um, so you have you have the resistance training, but try to get that low level uh, or that low intensity exercise in as well. Uh, so those are the highlights for me. And then you know, make sure that your diet is comprised of of you know foods that are close to nature, nutrient dense. Um, laugh, try, you know, to try to try to live in the spirits in any other way that you can during these difficult times. Wonderful. I love that. Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw, I believe you're on mute. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Trying to get out of the sun. Okay. So time restricted eating um, in what I call circadian fasting is what I do for myself, what I teach other people to do. I think it's like the busy person's um, window to fast because I think it's really great to do, you know, a 24 hour once in a while. It's really great to do longer fasts uh, for a lot of people, but I think a lot of busy people can easily do a time restricted eating in a circadian fashion. So that would be something like stopping food at least three hours before bed and that's the start of your fast. And then you go from there. So it may be from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. or it may be from 7 p.m. to 8 a.m., 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. So that between 12 and 15, 16 hours is a really great way to start and try it out. Um, and I also, this is, I like to do a fasted workout and not, uh, before I break my fast in the morning. And the reason why is that the magic of fasting seems to be in the metabolic switching. So if you are always using sugar for fuel, so you, um, you use up the sugar in your bloodstream and then your body's like, oh wait, I need more sugar. She hasn't eaten. It goes to your liver to get some sugar stores. But then once it runs out of that, say you wake up and you've used up your bloodstream stores, you've used up your liver stores, and now you're going for a walk or a resistance training or a workout, whatever's tolerable to you. Now the body has to switch fuel sources. And that seems to be the magic of the benefits of intermittent fasting is learning your body, learning how to metabolically switch fuel sources and say, now I'm going to use some of those fat cells, and break them apart and use fat for fuel. And so I really love fasted training when you can tolerate it in any form, 20 minute walk to an hour workout or more, and then eat your meal with protein uh, within an hour after that. Yeah, I, I, all great advice. And I have to put my two cents in. You know, I did a lot of research when I was doing the bone broth diet. And what I found is that when you fast comfortably with bone broth and you have a light meal at the end of the day, a light meal and put it in a 5-2 like formula, so two non-consecutive days a week, you fast on bone broth during the day and you have a light meal at night like Dr. Lyon talked about with that macronutrient kind of composition, the results were incredible. I put this to test in three different cities. So my point being is that we don't always have to white knuckle it. But we've learned from this panel, this delightful panel, is that there are a lot of benefits to fasting. There's different approaches, different ways to look at it. You, can, you don't have to white knuckle it. There are many ways that you can do this, and derive the benefits that you're looking for, and just start now. Just start. Just do something small. My favorite thing to do is, honestly, if you can just delay eating, even until 11 o'clock in the morning, you go to bed at night and you just delay till 11 in the morning, that will do leaps and bounds for your health, your immunity, and even your beauty. I know you touched on that, Dr. Shaw, but if you want good skin and eyes that pop white and all that kind of, that all, it all works together. All of this, what we talked about with the muscle retention and fasting. Thank you so much, panel. This has been amazing. I really appreciate your service and contribution tonight. We hope that we've helped everyone this evening. Please tune in tomorrow for Doctor's Night Out Deep Dive. 
where we have Bo Eason on to give us some motivation and some great mindset strategies. If you tune in noon on Instagram, you will find Dr. Shaw and myself having an amazing conversation that will continue on fasting and we'll get the latest COVID hits of the day. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Signing off with all the grace and all the love. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Thank you.